What it do, man? It's your boy Battle Truth coming to you live and direct from the Battle Truth headquarters. In conclusion, I give you the last story of the six men who met Jesus Christ personally in Jesus' life. How each one of these men were affected by this moment in time they met with Jesus. Remember, these six men, in one way or another, explains who you are. Which one of the six you are, I don't know, but you definitely know. I hope that out of these six men, you end up being one of the ones that gave their life to Christ. Because just like them six men had to make a choice and decision when they came face to face with Christ, now you have been given the gospel face to face with Christ. And what are you going to do with them? This is your purpose of why you was made, born, and created. The Bible says men was created for the glory of God. And women were created for the glory of men. We were made and created for God. For God himself. And you will never know your full potential and your divine purpose if you're not tapped into the life source, the art of life himself. The son of the living God, Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, I give you the last man in his story, an encounter with Christ, the son of the living God, God carnated in the flesh. The man who crucified Christ. We know very little about the Roman soldier who crucified Christ. His name, his home, his age, his nationality are all unknown. We do know that he, was on, that he was on active service in the province of Judea and that he was in charge of the crucifixion. He put Jesus to shame in front of a mocking crowd. The centurions we meet, a centurion is a person that is, uh, 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 the, is a soldier that's, that, that's uh, over a hundred soldiers. Century, centurion, a hundred years. So a centurion is a person who has ranked over a hundred people that's up under his authority. Soldiers. So the centurion we meet in the Bible are a fine group of men. They were commanders of the Roman army. There was a commander in Capernaum whose faith in Christ was commended by the Lord himself. There were Cornelius of the Italian regiment, Simon Peter's first Gentile convert, there was Julius of Augustan Regiment who showed his kindness to Paul. And there was the man who crucified Christ. On the day Christ died, at least two men trusted him, trusted him as Savior. Two men felt his saving grace. First the Jew on the cross beside him, and then the centurion at the foot of the cross. The first was a man who cursed him. The other was a man who crucified him. Let us walk up a rugged hill called Calvary and watch the crucifixion through the eyes of a gentle soldier. The Bible does not describe in detail the brutal process of nailing a man to the cross. To those living in that day, it was a common sight. Anyone with even a little imagination can picture the unusual went on, the struggling kicking victim on the cross, hand in hand, hand in the other hand, Roman soldiers on the other, driving their rusty spikes through tender flesh and into the rough timber behind. Then came the sickening thud as the soldiers lifted the cross and dropped it into a hole. Dropped it into a hole in the ground. And finally, the long, awful hours and the burning heat crept by with the jeering crowd looking on and poking fun. This is what the world did to the Son of God. The world crucified him and the centurion carried out the sentence. If you had asked him, probably he would have said, it is not my fault. I'm not responsible for this. I did not really crucify him. The men who condemned him did this to him. I am not as guilty as these priests who mocked him. But the fact remains, 
he went along with the crowd and crucified the Son of God. Even though he believed he was just doing his job. Unlike that Roman soldier, we have a completed Bible in our hands today. It tells us the outcome of this ghastly crime. The Bible warns us not to neglect the salvation God has purchased for us by the death of his son. Hebrews 2 verse 3. And uh, you and I must either accept his sacrifice for us in faith or reject it. We must face the fact that apart from Christ we have no hope. The crucifixion of Christ means as much today as it did back then. God is going to judge every man in the sight of Calvary. Where do you stand? In the person of Jesus? God has planned and carried out a personal visit to the planet. The reaction of the world was to get rid of him. Its reaction is the same today. The world, I mean, it would crucify him again if it could. Would you? The world would crucify Christ again if it could. Would you? To avoid crucifying Christ again, by our unbelief, we first must stop being so careless and indifferent about his death. We must consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Hebrews 12 and 3. This is what the centurion did. He soon began to realize what he had done. He began to consider Christ. And before long, he had to face the awesome truth of who Jesus really was. Somehow this man almost turned that ugly Roman cross into a throne. In some way, this event looked more likely. In some, in this, I'm sorry. In some way, this event looked more like they were crowning a king rather than killing one. The centurion had never seen such majesty in the face of such misery and such calmness in the face of such cruelty. He heard Jesus say, "Father." Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The word stunned and startled him. He had seen many men die, and men being crucified did not pray like that. No man he had ever known spoke like this man. Who was he anyway? And so the centurion looked and listened to the words and actions of Jesus began to hold him in a vice. They always do. When we give him the chance, Jesus' word grip us because he is our holy and loving God. He became aware of the depth and meaning of Christ's pain. It was not just the physical torture of crucifixion, for he has seen that many times. It was not just the hatred of the crowd. That was common at a crucifixion, even though it seemed more so here. Instead, it was the fearful darkness that fell over the countryside for three hours that awed him it was the uncanny midday midnight it was jesus awful cry my god my god why have you forsaken me here was pain beyond all human pain and it was inflicted on one who was holy harmless and sinless Finally, the centurion became aware of the power of Jesus. When Jesus finally gave up his life, he died. The earth shook. The rock split open. The heavy veil hanging in the Jewish temple ripped in two from top to bottom. All this was enough to make even a rough Roman soldier afraid. But perhaps the greatest miracle of all was the change that came over one of the thieves crucified with Christ. Today, you will be with me in paradise, Jesus said, Jesus said, said to the man when he had turned at last to Christ. The sudden and startling change in this man's word and action must have convinced the centurion that this was not an ordinary crucifixion. So the more the centurion considered Jesus, the more he became aware that Jesus was unique. He was a man who was more than a man, and he had gone along with the crowd and crucified him. Have you, like the centurion, considered Christ and what his death means to you? 
If you are the son of God, come down from the cross, jeered the priest. And if you are the son of God, save yourself in us, screamed the dying thieves. The son of God, that was it. Truly, this was the son of God, said the centurion at last. The Roman soldier spoke openly twice in the pages of the Bible. And it was to confess his belief in Jesus as a righteous man. Luke 23, 47. And as the son of God, Matthew 27, 54, with the simple confession, he took the step which put him on the saving side of the cross. When Peter had confessed, you are the Christ, the Lord had said to him, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it to you. But my father who is in heaven, truly, this was the son of God, said the Roman centurion. The man who had crucified Christ and who had considered Christ now confessed Christ. With these words, the only words of his, record, of his is recorded in the Bible. This man revealed that his heart had been touched and his eyes opened. He became one of the very few who came to the cross that day and took sides with Christ. Today you are doing one of the three. Either you are crucifying Christ, going along with the crowd, taking sides with the world, or number two, you are considering Christ, thinking about what his person, pain, and power mean to you, or you number three. Are you conf confessing Christ have you had your eyes open, your heart touched, and your tongue set free to confess him as the Son of God and personal Savior and Lord? Where do you stand in relation to the cross? Where do you stand? Where do you stand in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Y'all have heard me do these six studies, talking about the six men who met Christ, and where do you stand? Where do you stand in this? Do you stand like Pontius Pilate, who was a weakling, who handed Jesus over to keep his, his position because he didn't want to compromise his position among the people when he knew Christ was a righteous person but still decided to condemn him to death to please the people only to find out no matter how much you try to please people, they'll never be satisfied with you. So Rather doing the right thing, you do the wrong thing only to end up being condemned in your own actions. Are you like Pontius Pilate? Are you like Pontius Pilate who condemned Christ just to please and satisfy people without knowing him personally? Without fairly investigating the claim? Are you like Pontius Pilate? Or are you like the dying thief that hung on the cross right next to Jesus Christ who started out hating Jesus, cursing Jesus, mocking Jesus, but then suddenly had a change of heart as he listened to Jesus praying for the sins of men to be forgiven to the Father And begin to understand this wasn't an ordinary person. That this was truly the son of the living God. Who got convicted in his spirit. And in the conviction of his spirit. His heart was turned. As he turned to the Lord and said. Lord remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Are you like the thief. Who once hated Jesus. And now you hear the voice of the Lord calling, drawing you to the cross. And you yield and humble yourself and receive it. Are you like that person? Or are you like the man who crucified Christ? Doing a job, going about your everyday living, establishing yourself as being a person who's just taking care of business, having no need of God, 
believing you got everything that you need because things are going right for you in your life. Only to find out that no matter what you do, you always have that emptiness in you. Because that emptiness can only be filled by the spirit of the living God. The love of Christ. Are you like that man? Who find pleasure in other things. Without understanding. You will never know the fullness of joy. Until you are in the arms. In the family. Of the living God. Through Jesus Christ. Are you like that man. Who helped crucify Christ. How many times have you have. Told people about God. And he was wrong. Told people about. Uh, and you was wrong. Told people about Christ. And you was wrong. Said things about him. That Jeff wasn't true. Only to then have a change in heart. Once God convict you and draw you unto him, are you like that man? Are you like Judas, the betrayer? A person who confessed to be a believer. A person who believe in Jesus Christ, who know God real, who know the Bible is true. But you still ain't ready to accept him fully as Lord. You're playing both sides of the field. You want to be accepted by the world also. And you want to be accepted by the body of believers. Are you like that man? Are you like Judas? You know the word of God. You've been touched. You've been enlightened by. You know the truth about Christ. But you're so caught up in your sin that you believe it's greater than Christ. It is greater than Christ. And you don't want to give it up because you're comfortable with it. And you think you can play both sides and you can't. Are you like Judas that betrayed? Are you like also the man who murdered his conscience, King Herod? Are you like King Herod? You do wrong. You know you do wrong. The Spirit of the Lord is convicting you, but you harden your heart to it. You don't care. You just go about your everyday living, not caring, blaming everybody for Everything happening to you in your life for what you don't have, for what you didn't accomplish, for what you wasn't successful in. Everybody owes you something. It's always a problem. Everything you do, do, it's okay. You have a license to hurt and harm and do wrong, wrong and sin 24-7. Are you like that person? King Herod. Who was having sex with his own brother's wife. They were still married. Can't nobody tell you nothing. A person tried to tell you something. Like John the Baptist was trying to tell him. What he was doing was wrong. In the eyes of the Lord. And it was not right. Give your brother back his wife. And the man was beheaded. Because he told the truth. Are you like that? Do you crucify Christ because you're not willing to face your sins? You don't want to acknowledge your sins. So you betray him. You crucify Christ. You harden your heart to his voice because you're comfortable with your sins. Are you like that person? Or Are you like um, mm, I'm sorry. I think I did them all then. Yep. Nope. 
For all you like Nicodemus, a man who was born again. Nicodemus was a brother who, who thought he knew, but didn't really know at all. He taught, he was given, he had a position, he was respected, but he didn't really know who God was. He had mostly everything going for him, but the right thing, knowing who God was. He wanted to know. Started out taking slow steps, coming to see Christ at night, having private meetings with him, only to be changed and converted into acknowledging that Jesus is the Son of the living God who loves you. And Jesus never refused Nicodemus, but showed Nicodemus his love and compassion for him. And Nicodemus became born again. And this is the love and compassion that Jesus had for you also. So why would you reject that? Why would you turn that down? The gift of eternal life is free in all those who accept Jesus Christ. So don't sell yourself short. And this is your boy Battle Truth. It ain't my judgment. That's the question. It's yours. Click the link in the description box. Follow me on Instagram Live. I'm going to follow you back. Click the donation button also inside of the app if you're able. If you're not able, you don't, don't do it. Don't even worry about it. God will continue to provide. But if you're able, give. Your charity contributions, contributions and donations is definitely needed and appreciated. And I want to thank everybody for listening and being patient with me. Um, and I pray that y'all be safe out there. And it's your boy Battle Truth. And ain't my judgment, that's some question. It's yours. Subscribe to Battle Truth.